What's up guys, it's a great day to talk about rats, in particular about rat defense. So-called chess opening which starts off with a move pawn b6 or there are different variations of that which um, I'll share with you in a, in a moment. And the good thing about this opening is that it's really universal, really simple and therefore practical. You don't need to study anything. Basically, regardless of what white plays, you will be chasing the follow-up setup. For now, I'm just showing you the setup of pieces. Therefore, you fan cattle both of your bishops, the queen side, the king side bishop, then you develop your knights accordingly and you castle usually to the king side. So here's the setup and again, the great thing for you is that you can play a bunch of first moves unthinkingly and you also have little to no chance to blunder anything because all your pieces are really compact, they're protecting each other and there is literally nothing you can possibly lose here. Another advantage is that it's a really great counter-attacking system. Kind of like Hedgehog system in Sicilian and some other lines where you are ready to start your counterattack any moment you want because so far you keep your central pawn structure really flexible and at any moment you want you're ready to push any of your pawns forward. You know, any of these four pawns can potentially start uh, to go forward and start counterattacking the white center. Usually you would really go for that c5 pawn advancement. It's like the safest and the most solid way for you to start the counterattack without weakening your position at all. But like I said, the other counterattacking options are still viable, you can still consider them. Now I'll show you two different examples. The first one was played in a Blitz game. And after that we'll go to another one, which is really, really cool. One of the greatest games I ever saw, really. So here Black player firstly fianchetto the queenside bishop and after that the kingside bishop. There goes pawn e6, knight goes to e7, so far everything is according to your setup. Here black played knight to d7, queen to d2. At this point black played first typical move pawn to h6. As you can see by the white's last move queen to d2, he's preparing to play bishop h6 to trade off your fianchetto bishop. And even though it's not really dangerous for black, and yet, if you can prevent it, it usually makes your position even more solid and therefore, in this case, black can play h6 and prevent white from going bishop h6, even with a tempo, because white has to move the bishop away. You play bishop h4 and here black played pawn on g5, which is another common idea in this setup to use this expanded fianchetto where you're gonna gain some extra space as well. And after the bishop goes to g3, now after black goes knight to g6, you can see that black has more space on the king side and in some variations he's even ready to push his pawns forward and attack there. Not necessarily, but it just gives you an additional option. Or sometimes after your castle, of course, you can push the f pawn forward, which would also help you to uh, start your attack there on the king side. All in all, pretty cool thing. And as you can see, a whole lot of ideas that you have here. And this system is definitely not as easy for a white handle as it may seem at first. For example, in the current game that we're analyzing, white just played rook to d1 and after g4 he resigned. <laughs> All of a sudden, uh, it turned out that the knight there is trapped on f3 and it has no square to escape. And here's the final game that I promised to show you for today. And the game is super exciting. The game is between Paulson playing white and Blackburn. Both of them were fairly strong players at the time. So the game started with fairly standard moves. Black just sets their setup. White also develops the pieces and grabs the center. Black goes knight to h6. Well, we discussed that usually the knight goes to e7 and this setup, and it is certainly correct. But in this particular case, Black noticed that after knight goes to h6, this knight has the potential to jump to g4 and attack the white's bishop, which is somewhat restricted by the white's own pawns and pieces, and therefore black decided to develop the knight there. White played knight f3 to provide some escape squares potentially for the bishop, and black pushed pawn to f5. It wasn't super necessary, and yet, like we discussed earlier, it's one of the black's ideas to wait for the suitable time for the counterattack, and he decided to begin it right away. By playing pawn to f5 here, oops, something happened, yeah, here's the position. By playing pawn to f5, black is obviously putting pressure on the white's pawn. And white therefore plays pawn to e5 to close the center. And black plays queen to e7. Another really good move because black keeps it flexible still. And whether he's gonna castle king side or queen side, he saves both of the options and therefore uh, white needs to consider both of them. 
White played queen to d2. And at this point, black went knight to f7. I'm not really sure why didn't he go to g4. And after that, he could possibly capture the bishop. Bishop is stronger than a knight, by the way, just in general, because some chess books for beginners say that these are equal, equal pieces, but it's not exactly true. Bishop is a bit stronger, so if you can trade an opponent's bishop, it's usually favorable for you. Anyway, in the game, he played knight to f7, which is also okay. White played rook to d1, black hustled queenside. By the way, the really interesting thing about this game, it was actually a simultaneous game played by white being blindfolded. So it's really crazy. The guy was uh, not looking at the chessboard and was playing 10 games simultaneously, and yet he could play them at a really high level. White played pawn a4. Now we see the opposite side costling, and white is ready to attack there on the queen side. Black traded the pawns in the center and plays pawn h6. He's preparing similar kind of an attack on the king side. White played pawn a5, and here black played a really creative move pawn b5. Well, this is definitely very risky to play. Uh, pawn moves of the pawns that cover your king. So I would say that it is objectively speaking a mistake and yet it, it's a very creative move. We'll see now in a moment what was the black's idea. White played pawn a6. Really good continuation. It's not really the pawn sacrifice because if black captures this pawn, which would be a mistake because it would only help white after let's say rook a1 to attack there and get to black's king. So this is definitely very dangerous for black. That's why black retreated with their bishop back to a8. And now after white captured the pawn, we can see what was the black's idea. He captured the pawn on e5, taking advantage of the pin along the d-file. Here white traded off the knights onto e5, and after that he played queen to c3 to escape from the pin. Black played knight to g4, attacking the bishop. Bishop goes to f4, taking aim also at the black skin potentially. Black plays pawn to e5, and after the exchange there is a really intense situation, and white plays knight to d4, which is really cool because at the moment black was preparing some sort of discovered attack towards the, the white's queen, and instead of just defending, White keeps adding fuel to the fire, he's also going forward trying to keep attacking. And at this point Black played a really fantastical move, the move which is you know, really hard to make in a practical game, he played pawn of c5, and yet it's a great move actually, because even though it's super dangerous to play a pawn move which uh, totally uh, you know, makes your king so vulnerable, and yet it uh, keeps attacking, which is the main motif of chess. And if you keep attacking, that is usually the best thing you could do. There is an interesting point to think about here. At first it may seem like, oh, these are just so brilliant genius chess players that could play 10 games simultaneously without looking at the, those boards and still uh, keep finding those great moves. But on the other hand, you know, they're human beings just like you and I, and therefore, of course, it's not that somehow they have uh, a bunch of heads instead of one. It's just that they know the right way of thinking so that you can find the right moves easily, even being in such an intense situation when you have to play a lot of uh, games simultaneously. And if you want to find out how you can do it yourself, how you can find the right moves in any position easily, you can click the link on the screen or below the chess board and attend the free masterclass, the best way to improve at chess instantly. And for that masterclass, I summarized the training methods that help my students to progress the most and also the quickest. Again, it's free and you can click the link and go check this out. And now we're continuing with the game. White played rook to e1. He also wants to take advantage of the pin and he's pinning the black knight. And black goes rook takes d4 which is a temporary sacrifice because in the next move he goes knight to f3 with a whole bunch of attacking things here all around the board and the game is absolutely crazy really because if you think about this it's a really unique situation when you know, all the pieces are hanging both kings are weak and both guys are keep attacking each other none of them want to be the defender and just to, to back down white captured the knight black captured the rook with the check White played king to g2, and black played queen h4, removing the queen from attack as well as attacking the white's pieces, and the queen on c3 is still attacked. But white plays bishop g3, another counter attacking move. And in this position, black decided to keep playing for an attack, and he played queen on g4, which was not the best move. It was better for black to settle for a comfortable advantage, just capturing material here, 
And after this exchange, you see that Black won the exchange. He's got Rook against the Bishop in this endgame, which uh, gives him significant material advantage. And yet, in the actual game, he didn't go for this variation. He probably just wanted to finish the game with a checkmate. That's why in this position, instead of going for that favorable endgame position after a simple bishop takes c3, he played queen g4. He wanted to keep queens on the board, hoping to continue his attack. Of course, it's not that he's sacrificing the queen or blundering it because the pawn is pinned. White plays queen to b3. He's still looking for a counterattack. This time, queen e6 is coming, and black goes pawn f4, which is also simultaneously uh, not only attacks the white's bishop, but also covers that e6 square. It's really cool how both of these players are so creative in finding ways to keep attacking, keep coming no matter what. And even in this position, white played yet another attacking move. Bishop goes to c4, threatening bishop e6 check. Here black played queen to g5, and in this position white found a really cool uh, move which you know, kind of wins the game. It's the move bishop to g8. By playing such an unusual move, he's cutting that rook off the game and preparing for his own rook to jump onto the lost rank and to start chasing the black's king. Black tried bishop e3 to close the diagonal, but white sacrificed the rook to demolish the only piece which is like still covering black's king. And after pawn takes, now the queen can go to b8 and white starts attacking the black's king directly. And at this point, black actually resigned. And you can see that white just simply has too many threats to handle. For example, in some line like this, white would just promote the new queen and would checkmate the opponent's king very soon. And now let's have a little quiz for you. I just took a few steps back. In the actual game, as we saw, white played bishop g8 and won the game. And yet it was not even the strongest move. That was the way for white to finish the game even more impressively and more quickly. And you may think about this, and if you can find the winning shot for white, write it down in the comments below. It's not that easy, I gotta say, you gotta think about this, and if you can find it, I'll be really proud of you. I hope you enjoyed this chess thriller, and now you may wish to go to the free masterclass, the best way to improve your chess, instantly by clicking the link on the screen or below the video, so that you can find the most efficient ways to progress in chess and possibly add several hundred of rating points fairly quickly. I wish you the great rest of the day, and I'll talk to you soon.